Let us pray. Lord, we call back to remembrance everything that you and I discussed, every revelation you provided me. Bring those thoughts and those conversations back to remembrance. Make the hearts of your people, the soil of their hearts, make it fertile. So that the seeds, the words that are sown on this day will fall upon good ground. Remove distractions so that, God, we give you our undivided attention. Prick our spirits, convict us, compel us, and even convert us. That today, Lord, we leave here better than we were when we came. Teach us today how to look at relationships, friendships, through the spiritual lens through which you created them. So God, we thank you and we find purpose in this series of messages that you have ordained. So we're here right now asking you to speak to us. And helping us to be obedient to that which you will reveal to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said together. Amen. Look at your neighbor again and say, I'm glad that you are here. <laughs> Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Glad to see y'all. Glad to see y'all. It's always good to see um, those of my family and friends that we've married and they still say we're coming back because we still want some word from this particular community. We um, are embarking on a very sensitive subject. Um, as I've mentioned earlier, a subject that uh, usually when you talk about you have to be very careful um, it's easy to find offense uh, when you are dealing with the subject of friends and friendship. Um, usually when you bring up that word, there's already an image of someone in your mind, whether that's a positive uh, image or a negative image, wishing that someone else was here to hear what is being preached and finding a way to package it so that you can give it to someone so that they can listen to because they need it. Not you. They do. Um, but the people who are here today are the people who need to hear the word. God makes no mistakes. And so we're dealing with the subject on friends and friendship. And even if you ask me, I believe this still comes under the umbrella of Level Up, a series that we spent some time in at the end of our uh, last year. And as we enter into this season, still with the same uh, mentality and the same goal of leveling up in every area of our lives, we have to deal with the subject of relationships by way of friendships and how important uh, they are in our lives and in becoming who God has called us to become. Someone said, and I read it somewhere, and it was funny, they say, because you know, every year there is this tagline that I'm going to make my circle smaller or I'm going to get rid of some friends that I need to get rid of. And you know, every year we talk about how we need to get rid of some people out of our lives um, because they're taking up space and they're living rent free, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Someone wrote that if every year you're uh, cutting people off 
then the common denominator is not the people. The common denominator is the person always needing to cut people off every new year. I'll keep on going, just trying to warm the crowd up, just trying to warm the crowd up. Um, How about we look at it this way? Because in every series, I have to lay groundwork so that we can understand the importance of whatever the series is. But how about we look at it this way? The way God created the world, think about it. The way God created the world, nothing can exist without meaningful relationships. Let me help you make it a little more sense. The way God created from day one, the way God orchestrated things to flourish, nothing in God's kingdom, nothing in heaven can flourish without meaningful relationships. Let me help you then. Man, God needs to create woman. Woman needs man and man needs woman in order for certain things to be able to flourish. Relationship. Otherwise, God would have left Adam in the garden by himself, tending to the animals and tending to the garden. But yet, the way God assessed everything, he knew that man needed woman in order for certain things to take place, in order for ultimate um, destiny to be able to be realized. Let me move a little further. If you think about the sun... And the moon, you have to think about relationship. The sun is important. Talked about this many weeks ago. Yes, we know we always talk about the sun. The sun, if if it was any closer to earth, it would burn us up any further away. We'll freeze to death. It's right where it needs to be, sitting where it's sitting. The, The sun is absolutely important. But the sun needs the moon and the moon needs the sun. The moon is not the sun. The moon only reflects the light that comes from the sun. And so both of the moon and the sun have to be in a relationship with one another. They need one another. And better yet, we need both the sun and the moon. We can't exist with the sun alone. We need the moon because when the sun goes down, the moon then reflects the light coming from the other side of the world. And now we get the light that comes from the moon and also keeps the water away that's coming from the ocean so that we won't flood twice over before morning gets here. We need the moon. We need the sun to be in relationship and in relationship with us. Everything that God created, he created so that it has to be in a meaningful operative word relationship with something else. Let me help you with this. Think about the Godhead, the father, the son and the Holy Spirit. They are in a co-equal, symbiotic relationship with one another. No? Okay. Equal reciprocity relationship with one another. It's so important that when you look at Genesis chapter 126 and God is creating what God is creating, God says when it gets time to create human beings, God said, let not me, but let us create man in the image. Let us, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we are co-equal, we are in a relationship, a community, so when we see the Trinity, when we see God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, we see meaningful relationship. Otherwise, it's just me on the island doing what I do all day, every day, because I do, I, I am the reason that I get everything done. But nothing in God's kingdom, not your kingdom, but God's kingdom, 
can achieve its ultimate purpose without meaningful relationships. Is everybody following me? The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24, says, some friends play at friendship. I'll see, I knew I'd get some help eventually. It says, some friends, the New Revised Standard Version, which is, is one of your closest translations, it says, some friends play at Friendship, but a true friend sticks closer than one's nearest kin. Some friends play at friendship, but a true friend sticks closer than your blood. I like another translation that says, There are friends who pretend, same, same, same verse, different translation. There are friends who pretend, y'all hadn't lived long enough so you hadn't experienced this before. There's some friends who pretend to be friends, but there is a friend Who sticks closer than a brother? You'll find another translation that says something like a man, man or woman of many friendships, of many companions increases the likelihood of ruin. But there is a friend who sticks closer than the brother The text is very ambiguous with the translation and trying to understand what it's truly communicating, but some can walk away from the translation when it's saying a person who has a whole lot of friends is likely going to experience ruin of some kind. Did you know it's a such thing as having too many friends? I ain't like that. Somebody didn't like that one. It's such thing as having two little friends, too. Keep on talking. They'll get it. They'll get it. Just... <laughs> what I've come to learn about relationships, and more importantly, relationships by way of friendships, is that God filters his most important resources through relationships and specifically your relationships. God filters into your life the resources that he needs to get to you by way of your relationships. Every blessing and everything that comes in your life isn't so supernatural that you wake up and you walk outside and this is just on your doorstep. There's some things that God needs to get to you. There's some doors that need to be opened. And the only way that door will be open is by way of a meaningful relationship. There's some doors that need to be closed. And the only way doors are be closed will be will come through a relationship. And so if you have the wrong relationships. You could be the reason that resources have not been rendered to you that God has already released for you to have. Keep on talking. Your relationships are a reflection of the level of revelation and the level of authority that God has given you. We've talked about authority, we've talked, we talked about power, we've talked about revelation that God has made available to us. And many times, if you just pay attention to the relationships that you have around you, the meaningful and most meaningful relationships you have around you, it is indicative of what you understand, your level of revelation and your level of authority that God has given you. And some of us are living beneath our authority. 
Some of us are living beneath the level of authority and the power and revelation that God has given you because the relationships you have around you. Every single person in the Bible, the Bible that I read, every single person who achieved something miraculous, something meaningful, they achieved first a level of mastery in the area of friendships. When you read the Bible, every man, Every woman who accomplished something great also mastered or achieved a certain level of mastery in the area of friendships. Let me see if I can help you. Moses had a friend and brother by the name of Aaron. Moses was insecure. Moses was about to walk away from his calling and his purpose because he had a stuttering problem and he didn't think people would listen to him. And so what God decided to do is God filter resources into his life by way of a meaningful relationship, someone by the name of Aaron. Aaron steps into the scene. He becomes his assistant and he is the person who helps Moses become who Moses was called to become. Now, he didn't do all the work for Moses. He challenged Moses to step into his calling. He challenged Moses to be confident in what was coming out of his mouth. He didn't do all of the work. He helped Moses to become who Moses was called to be. Somebody say friendships. You think about Moses. You think about Joshua. You think about a man in Joshua who had to be so confident in who he was that he worked in the shadow of Moses for 40 long years as number two. 40 years old, he becomes the friend and the assistant to Moses. And it wasn't until he was 80 years old and Moses was 120 years old that finally he now comes out from his shadow and then takes over as Moses is retiring. For 40 years, he helped Moses, helped raise his hands and helped Moses to become who Moses was. Meaningful relationships. Or let me help someone else. Meaningful friendships. Think about Ruth. Naomi. You think about a relationship, a friendship that was based on reciprocity. Naomi needed Ruth. And Ruth needed Naomi. Let me prepare you for your boy. I'll keep on. David. David needed Jonathan. One of your pillar friendships in the Bible that we're going to talk about in just a few minutes is a relationship or a friendship by the name of Jonathan. Jonathan was next in line to become king and he makes a decision to sacrifice his job because he saw the calling in someone else that was greater than the calling that was on him and he was willing to say hey you would be a far better king than I would and I'm not going to be jealous about it let me help you to become the greatest king that you can become my daddy going to be upset with me but I see the calling on your life and we are covenant brothers and I told you that I'm going to be your brother until I die and because I am your brother I want to see you grow even if it means you growing beyond me I said something. I, I said something that somebody needs to. I, he, says to, he says to his friend, David, he says, I want you to grow. Even if that means you outgrow me. That's a true friend. And if Jonathan does not make the sacrifice for his friend David, David would not become the king. And I wouldn't be able to read the Psalms and get the revelation that I get. Because of a meaningful 
Friendship. A man or a woman of many friendships is going to likely experience some type of ruin because friendships require maintenance. And you can't give a whole lot of people the same amount of attention. You look at Elijah and Elisha. Elijah was out here on the block by himself performing miracles on his lonesome. Read 1 Kings 17. He's out here speaking and then there's no rain or no dew and he's getting used to doing things on his own. Then he gets tired, gets depressed. The Lord says, well, you out here trying to do everything by yourself. Everything in my kingdom must be a meaningful relationship with other things and other people. So go out and find a man. And he goes out and he finds a man in Elisha. And Elisha is the one who carries the mantle from Elijah. He says, give me a double portion of your character. If I can just be, a, if I can just have some of the character that you have, I can accomplish what God has for me. They were in a meaningful friendship. There's some things you can accomplish by yourself, Isaac, but there's some things you need to be in meaningful relationship by way of friendship with the right people. Somebody say friendship. You think about Barnabas and Saul. They were in meaningful friendship. So much so that Barnabas sought out Saul when nobody else would touch him with a long handled stick. We were afraid of Saul. Barnabas goes and seeks Saul out and then brings Saul with him to go and smooth it over with all of the disciples so that all of the disciples would now begin to look at Saul, who is Paul, and say, okay, we'll, we'll receive you because of our friend Barnabas. He speaks on your behalf and we'll, we'll, we'll receive you. Friendships will help you get to where you need to go because there's some things and some places I don't care how experienced you are I don't, how, I don't care how great your favor is I don't care how great your resume is meaningful friendships are the key to get you to where you are going but if you think about it on the other hand if you search throughout your Bible if you look at the Holy Writ and you examine characters and you try your best to find someone who accomplished something great who was not in meaningful friendship with someone else, it usually falters. You think about Jonah. Jonah had what you call ancient anger. He had anger so deeply rooted in his life that it kept him from being able to enter into meaningful relationships with people. Even when he got on the ship trying to get to where he was going, he was being toxic with other people. He, he had no meaningful relationships so much so he's just upset with God because God is forgiving people that he was upset with. He doesn't want God to love on people because he doesn't want people to be forgiven because what they did to his family long ago. And so he is out here all by himself. And just look at the book of Jonah. It ends abruptly. Doesn't give you any good happy ending. It just ends. He's despondent and he's upset and he's just outside of Nineveh and he's just complaining with the Lord and the Lord is trying to teach him some things. But there's just no meaningful friendships. He was just on his own. Because, you know, we, we use that introvert as an excuse or so use past experiences with betrayal as an excuse. So we think that it's a valid excuse to not enter into meaningful relationships moving forward. But there is nothing in the kingdom of God that you will be able to truly, truly accomplish outside of meaningful friendships. 
Think about Samson. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Examine Samson's life. This is the one person that we talk about throughout the Bible. The one who as his hair grew longer, he grew stronger. He had supernatural strength, but he had no friends. He had supernatural strength. God come upon him, but he had no meaningful friendships. And then we'll discover the one or two or three meaningful or the three or four friendships he had didn't last. And when you don't have meaningful people to hold you accountable People who are ahead of you, who can challenge you to be greater, not just people who keep you comfortable, people who agree with you, but people who show you a mirror that nobody else will show you. People who won't just tell you what you want to hear, but will tell you things that will hurt, but it will also help at the same time. Hello, somebody. Because we are very careful how we choose our friendships. We'd like to choose the people in which we'll get into in just a moment because I want to talk to Aristotle, one of the Greek philosophers who teaches us about friendships today. I want to talk because he, he has some good points for us to abide by today. But we'll be very careful in how we choose our friendships. We choose those friendships that keep us comfortable we don't want people who are going to speak truth to us. Not all. Oh, I, don't, I don't need that. We don't want people who their success reveals to us how much we're stagnant, how much we're living pipe dreams, or the more they're successful, the more it shows us we're not successful. So we, we separate ourselves from the people who are really, really accomplished. We just rather be in a space with people who we just share the same experiences. We'll keep this cyclical, this cycle going. Or people who represent where we've been. So every time we get together, we're always reminiscing on what had happened. Let's talk about that too. I'm talking about friendships because there's a lot of things we can talk about. We talk about power of God. We talk about the glory of God. We can talk about all these things. But if we don't take the time to talk about how to actually be a friend. And the importance of friendship. You can have the glory of God on you. You can have the favor of God on you. But if you keep mismanaging the people in your life, if you keep only looking at people as a means to get to the next place, if you only look at your network as a network that works for you, you will never be able to truly truly experience the fullness of God. Being in God's kingdom is based on meaningful relationships. Hmm. And so here is the real statement. The greatest obstacle to our spiritual growth, the greatest obstacle to our maturation is the lack of meaningful friendships. One of the greatest obstacles, one of the greatest barriers for you achieving the maturity that you need to achieve, one of the greatest barriers that will keep you from accomplishing or, or, or reaching the level of spiritual growth you need to reach is the relationships in your life. But let me give you five things that serve as an obstacle to your spiritual growth. Number one, we don't have friends. I'm not talking to you, I'm just talking to the person next to you. <laughs> the greatest obstacle to your spiritual growth, the greatest obstacle to your maturity is the fact that you don't have any friends. You 
rolled so low. So low that nobody can reach you. That wasn't even in my notes. I don't even know where that came from. <laughs> Praise the Lord Jesus for the humor. I'm joking, but I'm so sincere. For someone in here, and someone even in our digital space, your greatest obstacle to maturity, your greatest obstacle to spiritual growth is at the end of the day, you don't have any real friendships. For someone else, the second thing that's keeping you from maturity or achieving spiritual growth You have friends, but you've outgrown the ones that you have. We have outgrown the friends that we do have. Think about it. Think about that. Think about this for a moment. The friends that you've outgrown. You won't say it because your friend's next to you. You're probably thinking about them. You're always trying to justify, you always have to justify your decisions and who you are. You always have to justify and explain the decisions you make and, and the positions you take. And, and you always feel like you have to say yes, because if you say no, you feel guilty. You always feel that you got to change who you are to satisfy this friendship. I know it doesn't apply to anybody in here. But you know, this friendship, you just always have to either dumb yourself down or you have to always come to their level of the room or agree or see things the way they see them in order for there to be peace in your friendship. You always have to explain and when you leave them, you always tired. Don't get into next week's message. Don't get into next week's message, Isaac. That's next week's message. I didn't mean to step into um, the five friends you need to avoid in the new year. That's, that's next week if the Lord shall tarry. Get back here, Isaac. Today's message. Mm. You'll forget it when we get there. So just act like you never heard it before. But you're vexed. Every time you leave, that friend's presence. You've outgrown them. But, you know, these are the friends you have. And so you just settle for it, right? And you wonder why you're in the place and the position and feeling the way you're feeling. You've outgrown the friends, but you're too afraid to admit it and do anything about it. The third reason, here's the third reason. We don't know how to make friends. Are you laughing and you're acting like you don't know what I'm talking about? But the truth of the matter is, you don't actually know how to make friends. You don't know the first about making friends. Or maybe you do. But for some of us in here, I don't care how seasoned you are, how many friends you have had or had not, but sometimes these experiences jade us. We're afraid, just like in relationships, romantic relationships, we just don't know how to make friends. We, we get into these friendships and then we lose ourselves. Everything is always about the friendships. We don't know where to begin. We don't know how to create boundaries. We don't, we don't know how, how, how do you make friends? It's supposed to just happen. When you were six years old, friends just happened. When you were 10 years old, friends, you go outside and you just friends. <laughs> Somebody outside, they playing with grass, you play with grass and then you're friends. <laughs> But for the rest of us in here, friendship doesn't happen like that. 
all friendship is not organic. It doesn't just happen. The problem with many of us, we're waiting on the friendships to just happen. And if they don't just happen organically, they're not supposed to happen. I don't know where you got that lie from. Because when I look in my Bible, there is a man by the name of Ananias of Damascus. When Saul, who is now named Paul, when he had fell off that horse and he had an encounter with the crucified Jesus Christ and he went to this place and he's now blind. God came to Ananias and said, I need you to go to a place in Damascus. There will be a man by the name of Saul. I want you to get him and I want you to help him to regain his sight. And Ananias said, hold up, Lord. I ain't going to go nowhere where Saul is. I heard about him. And I don't want to help him do anything. I don't want any parts of him. And the Lord had to, con- they're in an argument. They're in a back and forth discussion. I don't want, I don't want any parts of that. And then eventually, Damascus or Ananias has to go to Damascus. He sought out Saul. He seeks out Saul. He helps him to his feet. And then immediately helps him to regain his sight. If he does not seek out a person who normally he would not have any relationship with. Saul's scales would not fall from his eyes. He would not help him now. So Barnabas, when Barnabas now seeks him out, he's healthy. And so now they enter into, there is no Barnabas and Saul if there was not an Ananias. Who sought out someone who normally he would not have desired to even be in a friendship with. We got two different political views. We come from two different religious and liturgical experiences. Why do I want to be in relationship or friendship with you? Some friendships will not happen just because y'all are sitting in the same table on Sunday morning. Just because you go to the same church or you work at the same job, there's some friendships that you have to pray through and you got to pray. You just got to, Lord, I need you to help me. There's some things and some people, the reason that you hadn't gotten to where you need to go to is because you refuse to form some alliances with some people you don't even know are you're going to be your greatest blessing. We don't know how to make friends. But another thing is, we don't know how to choose the right ones. We don't know how to choose the right friends. I know some of us, we're great at friendships. We say we're great at friendships, but we're lousy at romantic relationships. It's an oxymoron. Because a romantic relationship at the core of it is still a friendship. And so you can't be great at friendships, making friends, but not so great at romantic relationships. They both, at the heart of them, are friendships. But here's the thing. Did you know there's a such thing as picking the wrong friends? I'm not talking about just people who just make you go out to the club and make you do negative things. There's just some people who just don't bring out the best in you. Just simple as that. They might be comfortable but they might not be your destiny partner. Hmm? And so one of the things that keeps us from achieving what we need to achieve is the fact that we still are choosing, even today in 2020, we still are choosing the wrong friends. And you can't make the right friends Outside of the help of the Holy Spirit, you try to do it in your own flesh, you're going to get flesh results. But it's not until you seek out God the same way you seek God for a romantic uh, life partner is the same way you seek God for the right friendships as well. You can't trust God for your spouse, but don't trust God for your best friend. Am, am, I, am I trying to help somebody? You seek out God for friendships just as much as you seek out God for a spouse. Because both of them help you to become who God has called you to become and help you to open and close doors the way that God needs them to be closed and open. Another reason, and the last reason, is we don't know what healthy friendships look like. 
Some of us have yet to see what a healthy friendship looks like. I'm talking about a, a friendship with boundaries, a friendship that the other person doesn't always guilt you because you don't agree with them, a friendship that you don't have to sacrifice who you are just for who we can be. I'm talking about a real genuine friendship where there's actually both of us, we're actually mutually benefiting and we're both healthy in this friendship. Friendships can be unhealthy. You don't need to spend all of your time with your friends. Just as much you don't need to spend all of your time alone. But if you don't have a blueprint, if you don't have something healthy to to hold up as an example, we continue to enter into these relationships, both romantic and platonic, and we continue to do the same thing that we've always done. You need friends. I need friends. So when you say all that, Isaac, I'm glad that you, you got us here. Y'all see my PowerPoint, praise the Lord. Ancient Greeks, philosopher Aristotle, he is the one who laid the groundwork for Western philosophy. I like Aristotle because he's a great mind. Many of the things that we embrace today in 2020 in the United States of America is because of great thinkers like Aristotle. Aristotle has this opinion in some works that he wrote. He's the one who wrote that a friend is one who holds up a mirror to each other. And through that mirror, you can see each other in ways you would not normally be able to see. He says that the friendship should be reciprocal and it should help you to improve who you are. But in talking about friendships, a unique thing that he discusses is that friendships usually come in three different types. And it's amazing. It's so simple, but at the same time, it's so revealing. He says there's three types of friendships, and I'm not trying to throw shots at anyone, but you have to assess the relationships in your life as well as yourself. He says there's three types of of, of friendships. He says, number one, there is friendship based on utility. Make sure you write that down, utility. In other words, there's relationships based on usefulness. There's friendships based on the fact that you are useful. Let me, this is what he says. Friends whose affection is based on utility or usefulness. It says do not love each other. It says based on utility, do not love each other in themselves, but only as far as some benefit accrues to themselves as a result of the relationship. I don't love you just to love you. I love you because you're beneficial to me. Oh, you, you never had the type of friendship. Let, let me help you. Let me help you. He says a friendship of utility. We love our friend for our own good, not simply because they deserve to be loved, but because they're useful and they are agreeable. He says the friendship of utility. For example, mo- this is the one that's often overlooked, but most of your friends of utility come in your place of employment. Keep, yeah, this is exactly what I said. The most common and often overlooked of our friendships come in a place of employment. My coworker is my friend because the work day would be a lot more painful if they were not. Usually, many of the friends, not all, that we make in the workplace are limited to the workplace. If you leave that job, most of the people who you call friends at your place of employment will also, those friendships will also dissolve. Many friendships we have are friendships based on what you do for me 
and what I can get from you. I only call you when I need something. You're my friend, but when you think about it, most of the time you engage one another, it's because of the mutual benefit that you get from one another. The job that you have, the business friendships that you have, it's because of what you can do for me. There is friendships that are based on usefulness. All right. Your neighbor is your friend because when you leave, they watch, they, they watch a place for you. If they didn't watch their place for you, you probably wouldn't talk to them. Keep on, just keep on. And these, these friendships that are based on utility are selfish because they're based out of self. They're shallow and they easily dissolve. They're dissolvable. All right, so, so, so think about it. If you look at Acts chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, you, it, it'll tell you that, that it was, uh, I believe it was Peter and John, they were on their way to a temple, three o'clock every day. And when they got to the temple, there's always this man who would be brought to the temple by his friends so that he could sit there and that he could beg for alms every day. I don't have to preach the message other than to tell you, think about the friendships of the man who brought him to the temple. Sometimes there's some people who are just friends because they can get you to where you need to go. Every day, three o'clock, they bring him to the temple and they're there because of what they can do for him. There's some people in your life and you need to accept it. The reason that you're friends with them is because they carry you. You look at 1 Samuel chapter 16. You think about King Saul. King Saul is now being... He has these, 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 these moments where he, his mind is unsettled and he needs someone who can play the harp, who can settle his spirit. And so he goes into all of the land and the Bible says that he discovers a man by the name of David who is skilled at the harp. David comes to the kingdom, comes to the palace and begins to play the harp. And every time he plays the harp, the spirit that is on the inside of Saul that is raised up would calm down. And so much so Saul went back to King or to David and said, tell your daddy that I need you to come and work for me. And the Bible says he loved David. But why did Saul really love David? Not because he just loved him. He loved David because what David could do for him. There is a friendship based on utility. There is a friendship based on pleasure too. The friendship based on pleasure. Aristotle says the motive of this type of friendship is often guided by emotions. Now get this. Therefore, we pursue these friendships based on what is pleasant to us. And get this, and what is the object of the moment. We seek out these friendships based on what is pleasant to us and what is happening in this moment. So, and then he goes on, he says, and the things that please us, here's the thing, as we get older, those pleasures change. And when you develop friendships based on what pleases you, every year you get older, your taste changes. And if you base your, your, your friendship on the moment, when that moment changes and your age changes and your taste buds change, so does the friendships too. So you, you make these friendships and these friendships also dissolve. You know, you know, people you go out, you hang out with, you get something to drink with, pleasure, the moment. Sports, whatever, the sports, the season is over with, so is the friendship. Next year the season starts, hey, we can be friends again. Think about whatever pleases you. These are friends. You laugh together. You joke together until those jokes no longer make you laugh. And then you move on. You, you, base, you base friendships on pleasure. 
and on that moment. And when you base your friendships on utility, what makes you what's useful to you, people are useful to you until they're no longer useful to you and you have no need for them. You base friendships on pleasure, the things that make you happy, the things that make you laugh, the things that make you joyful until your taste buds begin to change and you move into a new friendship or you move into a new relationship and then all of a sudden you're no longer in that friendship any, anymore because I, what used to make me laugh doesn't make me laugh anymore and because it no longer makes me laugh and all we really did was talk about those things and we no longer have a reason to be in friendship. There's, there's friendship based on utility. There's friendship based on pleasure. What do I mean by pleasure? I know the time is of the essence, but if you look, not now, but for homework, you look at Judges. And the thing about Judges chapter 14, 10 through 20, your homework. The Bible is going to tell you that Samson's father made arrangements for their marriage because Samson was about to get married y'all and the father made arrangements for the wedding ceremony so Samson threw a party everybody say party. party and the Bible says around about verse 10 and 11 that Samson threw a party and in verse 11 it says when the bride's parents saw him they selected 30 young men from the town to be his friends and so now he has these close acquaintances because he's throwing a party and these acquaintances are going to be in his wedding. And something happens where he has a riddle and he makes a bet with his friends who he's throwing a party with because he's about to get married, y'all. And he says, y'all have seven days to figure out the riddle. And if you don't figure out the riddle, you have to buy me some things because you didn't figure out the riddle. And so they talked to Samson's wife and Samson's wife gave them the answer to the riddle. They come to Samson. What I love about this on at verse at the end of the verse 14, it says, so before sunset on the seventh day, the men of the town came to Samson and gave their answer. They gave their answer to Samson and then now Samson was enraged that he broke off all of his friendships with them and he left. And you want to know what happened? The Bible says that his best man married his wife. I'm talking about the 30 friends who were friends because I was throwing a party. Pleasure and the moment. And on the seventh day, when the party was about to be over and the wine is about to run out, so is my friendship. When you build your friendship on pleasure and on the moment, when that season is no longer in service and you're no longer see single anymore, and now you're married and all of a sudden the single friends ain't your friends anymore. I said that with a little conviction, didn't I? Maybe something hidden there somewhere. Let me, let, me, let me root that thing out. But the Bible says that he made friends, not because he made friends, but because he was throwing a party. And so you got to be careful because there's some friendships you're developing, not because of genuine friendship, but it, because there's something that you all like, something that pleasures you both and you both have something in common. But soon as that moment changes... Soon as that pleasure shifts, so will what you thought was loyalty. The last thing, because I had to give you this, the last thing is this. is friendship based on virtue. And this is the one that Aristotle says requires time and intimacy. These are the ones that you can't just develop overnight because he says that what we try to do is we we desire friendships so badly. Aristotle says that we expect for them to come quickly. And so we immediately enter into a friendship and give someone the title of friendship when they haven't even shown themselves to be friendly. And you haven't even shown yourself to be worthy of friendship. The Bible, te- that same verse 18 and 24, if you read the right translation, it says, he who has many friends must first show himself to be friendly. 
That's what the text says if you read it from the King James Version. And so you look at this, and then you, you look at the, he says, this is one that's based on virtue. This is the one who seeks out friends, not because of what I can get from you, but because I see something in you, and I also want to help you to become the greatest person that you can become. He calls the greater good. These are the people that you enter into a relationship based on truth. These are the people that you pray for. These are the people that will put, put the mirror up to yourself. These aren't the ones who are necessarily agreeable. These are, the, these are the relationships that takes time to form. These are the friendships that you don't, does not happen overnight. The friendship based on virtue is the one that is the most rare. That is what Aristotle teaches us because the other two you get all the time. It's so easy. But this one is the one that is so difficult to come by and most of us don't want to put in the time because Because it requires attention. He says there's the friendship based on virtue. The friendship based on virtue says that I don't not only see something in you, but I want to make sure that I can help you to become who you need to become as well as you helping me to become who I need to become. Because many times we get caught up in the one-sided friendship. I'm always making the sacrifice. I'm always playing the clinician. I'm always the physician. I'm always the one trying to help you, but never is it coming the other way. And so we talk about the one that's on virtue And that's when you look at Jonathan and that's when you look at David. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 18 and 1, after David finished talking with Saul, he met Jonathan, the king's son, and there was an immediate bond between them for Jonathan loved David. And if you read in chapter 20, it got so rough that Jonathan talks to his father Saul on behalf of David. And then Saul curses his son and says, you think you think I don't know that you want David to be king instead of you? You are a disgrace to the family. I'm going to kill David because I don't want him to be king. And then Jonathan goes out, tells David the exact plan of how his father is planning to kill him. He sacrifices his friendship with his father for his friendship with his brother because he saw something in Jonathan He saw the spirit of God in Jonathan that he was willing to make a sacrifice. I will give you the position because you deserve that position more. That's what God has over your life. I know what God has called me to do and he didn't call me to be king. I'm supposed to be king, but that's not my calling. People say I'm supposed to be king, but that's not my calling. God didn't call me to be king. And he was willing to make a sacrifice for who he called his covenant brother. And when you read the last verse of chapter 20 of 1 Samuel, they made sure they renewed their covenant to death did them part so that even their children would be able to benefit friendship. This is why when Mephibosheth, the one who was crippled from the age five, when he was crippled and he was living out in Lodabar and nobody loved him, nobody gave him attention, David, who was now king, said, I need you to find that young man by the name of Mephibosheth because of my best friend, Jonathan, who's long dead and gone, but my friend, that's my, still my friend, and I'm going to be a friend to his son. That's what you call a real friend where you don't have to talk to all the time to keep up so so they won't keep putting your friendship up for debate you know the one who you 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 can talk every now and then and you still pick up where you left off the type of friend that Jonathan and David were the type of friend that we need in our lives but we can't ask God half-heartedly for a friend that we really need. We need to be able to fast and pray for even the friends that we're desiring. There's something that you need, a place that you need to go, someone you need to become. And the truth of the matter is, the shallow friendships and the shallow encounters won't be able to get you there. You're going to need a God relationship. You're going to need a destiny partner. And so over the course of the next several weeks, we're going to break down this subject of friendships. We'll have a little fun next week, but we're going to talk about the five friends you need to avoid. And I still use them as friends instead of saying people because some of us, we use the term friends very loosely. But there's five friends you need to avoid in the new year 
and you need to be here next week so we can discuss it. Lord, we bless you. We thank you. We love you. Help us to go back to 1 Samuel chapter 20. 1 Samuel chapter 14. Help us to go back to Judges chapter 14. Help us to review your word. Help us to learn about friendships. Help us to ingest and digest our passage for the day in Proverbs 18 and 21. Help us, Lord, to reset what we think we know about friendships and about relationships because we want destiny partners, but Lord, we must first make sure that we're worthy of being friends ourselves. Help us to become better. Help us to hear your spirit as you speak. We thank you, God. We love you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. See you all on next week if the Lord shall tarry.